Hi everyone and welcome to the video on uh, formal charges and exceptions to the octet rule. So we're going to start with formal charges um, and what this is going to be focusing on is how to determine which Lewis structure uh, is the best representation. So formal charge is a way to determine which Lewis structure is the best representation of a molecule. So if we have uh, different resonance structures, we have different possible Lewis structures, um, formal charge is actually going to help us determine which is the best, which is more likely um, to actually occur. And when we're looking at formal charge, the best Lewis structure is the one that has the atoms with the formal charges closest to zero. And we're going to look at an example in just a second. But to calculate formal charge, there are two different equations that you can use. The main definition, the main equation of formal charge is the number of valence electrons on that atom minus the number of bonds that the atom forms minus the number of lone electrons. So again, valence electrons minus number of bonds minus number of lone electrons. Or I think what is easier is taking the number of valence electrons and actually just subtracting the number of electrons assigned to the atom. And I'll actually show you an easy way to look at uh, this second formula. So to start out, I want you to draw the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. So I want you to pause the video, take a quick second, uh, and draw the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. So with carbon dioxide, we have CO2. Okay, so carbon dioxide is CO2. Um, C is by itself, so that's going to go in the center, and then we're going to put an oxygen on each side. Now notice this is part of cons, right? C, O, N, and S. Those are the ones that can form multiple bonds, which means there's a possibility that we could form uh, multiple bonds with this. So we're going to do the 6N plus 2 rule. So N is your number of heavy atoms, that would be 3. So we have 18 plus 2, that is ooh, 20. Okay, so 6n plus 2 rule to determine a number of electrons that are needed. Okay, so we need 20 electrons. If we count up our valence electrons, uh, O is 6, so that's 12, and C is 4, so 12 and 4 is 16. So we have 16 valence electrons, we need 20. So notice this difference, it's four less. So it's either two double bonds or a single and a triple. Now you might say, well, how do I know which one? Well, let's start by showing one with double bonds. Okay, so here we're drawing the one with double bonds or let's draw the possible single triple bond. And now we have our double bonds, now let's fill our octet. So one, two, three, four on this oxygen, four on this oxygen, and carbon already has uh, eight around it. And then with this one underneath, oxygen needs six around this one. So there's six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So here are two possible Lewis structures for carbon dioxide. Now, what we want to do is we want to look and see which one is the best. So here's our first example, here's our second. Now, the easier way to show you with the formula is draw circles around each atom going right through the bond, kind of like this box did. Okay, so here's our circle. Now, you're taking the number of valence electrons, compare it to the number of electrons you have here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six valence, there's six around here, this is a formal charge of zero. Carbon has one, two, three, four, right? We're splitting this bond in half. Carbon normally has four, that's a formal charge of zero. This oxygen again, six and six, formal charge of zero. Okay, versus this second one. So let's draw the circles. And okay, now with this circle, let's look. This has two, four, six, seven. 
Normally it should have six. It has one extra electron, so it's minus one. This C is zero. This has one, two, three, four, five. It should have six. It has one less electron, so it's plus one. That's a way to look at formal charges. Now what we want to do is we want to compare the formal charges. So the, the Lewis structure on the left, all formal charges are zero. The one on the right has one that's minus one, one that's plus one. So the Lewis structure that is the best representation is the one in which the formal charges are zero. So this diagram on the left is actually the best representation of carbon dioxide because our formal charges are all zero. Okay, so just to summarize, the best Lewis structure is the one with the fewest charges, okay, the one that uh, has the most closest to zero, um, or the best Lewis structure is the one that puts a negative charge on the most electronegative atom. So if we look at one, two, and three down here, right, we can ignore one right away. Right? Why can we ignore one when compared to two and three? Right? One has only one zero formal charge. The other two have, have two that are zero. So we can ignore one. Now looking at two and three, we have zero, zero, and negative one. Now the best Lewis structure is going to be the one that puts the negative on the most electronegative atom. Well, the more electronegative between N and O is actually O. So this diagram 3 is actually the best representation of CNO because it has the fewest charges and the negative is on the most electronegative atom. Okay, so now we're going to look at resonance and exceptions to the octet rule. This is 8.6 and 8.7 in your book. Resonance structures, so this is going to be the possibility of having more than one Lewis structure. So this is the Lewis structure that we draw for ozone. So we have O3, um, we have a double bond and a single bond. All of the octets are filled. But this actually isn't the only real resonance structure because if you actually observe the structure of ozone, all of the OO bonds are the same length, and if you actually look at formal charges and electron density, both of the, op the outermost oxygens actually have a charge of minus one half. So something has to be different with these Lewis structures. So what happens is one Lewis structure can't accurately depict a molecule like ozone. So what it's said to have is a resonance structure. So we have the diagram on the left, this is correct, right? We have the central oxygen double bonded to the left, or let's put an arrow in between. Okay, that means we could have either or the central double bonded to the right. So these are resonance structures. They both are correct. And what happens is the actual diagram is somewhere in between. So just as green is the synthesis of blue and yellow in art, ozone is a blend of these two resonance structures. It's somewhere in between the two. And so the reason this is is because um, electrons don't always sit in a bond. They actually move between the bonds. So what they're said to be is delocalized. Okay? They're moving back and forth between this double bond and this double bond, which is why the resonance structure is somewhere in between. They are delocalized electrons. They're moving around the atom within the double bonds. Um, another example of resonance is the organic compound benzene. So benzene has two structures. These are cyclic. Okay? They um, are circular. Uh, and the two resonance has one with double bonds between um, certain carbons. The other one has double bonds uh, in the other locations. And so these resonance structures are actually represented with a hexagon and a circle inside because this circle actually shows that your electrons are moving about these double bonds. Now we're going to get into cyclic structures and benzene when we do organic at the end of the year, so you don't have to worry about how to draw Lewis structures for organic molecules right now. Um, it's just important to know that electrons are moving around through the double bonds and they aren't just in one location. And finally, we're going to look at exceptions to the octet rule. 
So with exceptions to the octet rule, look at the Lewis structures notes at the very bottom of the page to review these exceptions. So there are three types of ions or molecules that do not follow the octet rule. The first are ions or molecules with an odd number of electrons. The second are molecules with less than an octet. And the third are molecules with an expanded octet. So they have more than eight valence electrons. So though it's relatively rare um, and usually it's not stable at all, there are some molecules with an odd number of electrons. If you look at NO, for example, okay, NO has an odd number of electrons. So what happens is you're actually going to have one of your atoms that will only have one electron surrounding it. So instead of having lone pairs and having a full octet, for example, this nitrogen has just a single electron. This is actually what makes it extremely unstable and reactive because that one electron will react very easily. Um, another example, or another exception, rather, to the octet rule uh, are fewer than eight electrons. So boron is an exception to the octet rule. Boron only needs six electrons. So consider BF3. Okay? If you give boron a filled octet by double bonding um, the fluorine in BF3, the boron becomes negative and the fluorine becomes positive. Um, this is an inaccurate picture at all because first of all, halogens will not double bond. Okay? Halogens will not double bond. Um, they prefer always to be negative, especially fluorine. Fluorine having a positive charge is against all of the electronegativity trend that we've been talking about. So this doesn't place an accurate picture of BF3. So what actually happens is boron only having six valence electrons. So even though these all technically um, have a filled octet, okay, we are not worrying about this at all because this places positives on the fluorine. This BF3 with single bonds and six valence electrons on boron, this places the negative on each of the fluorines um, and boron is stable, right? We don't have to worry about it being unstable. So boron is one that only needs six valence electrons to be um, complete. So it's not actually an octet because it only needs six. Okay, so uh, just a quick kind of lesson on this. Um, if filling the octet of the central atom results in a negative charge on the central, and a positive charge on the more electronegative atom, don't fill the octet, right? So if by putting you know, a double bond with fluorine, that's gonna make fluorine more positive and one more negative, don't do it, right? You'd rather have fewer than not enough. But with this, boron is the only, boron and beryllium, right, are your two that have less than eight electrons. So more than eight electrons. Um, we have many molecules that have an expanded octet. So the only way PCl5 can exist is if phosphorus has 10 electrons around it. Um, it is allowed because uh, third row or below, we have the D orbitals, and the D orbitals will participate in bonding. So these extra electrons, even though we only want eight valence, right, technically in the S and P orbitals, we do have some space in the D orbitals for bonding that if we need to put electrons in there, we can. And you'll know it's an expanded octet because it'll be, you know, PCl5 or SF6, right? So by placing the single atom in the center and surrounding it, um, you'll notice that you're going to have a larger, um, more than eight. You'll have a larger octet. It'll be expanded. Um, so then another one is phosphate. Okay, so even though we can draw a Lewis structure for phosphate that only has eight electrons around the central, uh, the better structure actually puts a double bond between the phosphorus and one of the oxygens because that gives one of the oxygens a zero and it gives the phosphorus also a formal charge of zero. So that is actually the better, this one on the right is actually the better diagram, the better Lewis structure. And this actually is resonance because you can move this double bond to the top oxygen or to the right or to the bottom. Okay, so again, it eliminates the charge on the phosphorus and the charge on one of the oxygens. So the lesson with this, uh, when the central atom is in the third row or below, and if expanding its octet eliminates some formal charges, then do so.